Hello, hello. You guys ready? I don't hear anyone. Oh, probably because you don't see me, okay. All right. You guys ready? For the last session of the event. How was the event? Good, good, good. And what made you decide to stick to the last session instead of just parting already? Well, I appreciate it. Whatever, you, uh, whatever your reason is to decide that you wanted to stick around, because without you guys, I'd be just talking to myself. <laughs> How many of you are collecting frequent flyer miles that I was giving away? A couple of them. Great. Good to see you. How many of you are collecting double frequent fire mites that I'm giving away? All right. So you guys know what I'm talking about, a whole lot of nothing. But thank you for sticking around. I know it's last session, but I'll try to make it fun. Um, load balancing is an interesting subject. Right, so um, when I started, and I'm going to take you into my introduction as well, is I started with Exchange in 95, 96. Um, there was no concept of load balancing at that time. We didn't need that. You know, who needs load balancing? I mean, well, who needs load balancing wasn't the question. What you needed was the question, right? Um, it was, the idea was scale up. You are running out of resources. Make the box bigger. Give it another processor. Add more memory. Scale up. Right? Um, I'm not trying to go into load balancing history. I'm trying to go <laughs> into my introduction. So from there, I have been doing exchange forever, ever since I did start my career in IT. I did a little bit of multimedia. I did a little bit of um, Windows, Windows NT, and going into uh, training as well. Going from there, um, I picked up a lot of other things along the way. Uh, did security, RSA, Citrix, VMware, everything that comes our way, right? We are all IT guys, and you know how it goes. You just learn as you go and pick up more things. However, Exchange never left me, or I never left Exchange. So, um, as the time went on and Microsoft Certified Master was introduced, I took uh, Exchange 2010 Masters. I did Link 2010 Masters. Then I did Exchange 2013 Masters right before it went away. So for those of you who know MCM, great. Those of you who don't, don't worry about it. It doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it will return someday. And recently, after I left, Mac, my, after I left Microsoft a year and a half ago, I became eligible to become an MVP and don this somewhere here T-shirt of an MVP, right? So I'm an MVP starting this January, so this is my first time being an MVP, and I hope I'll continue contributing to community and continue retaining my status, but we'll see. Um, I work at Camp Technologies uh, as a director of product research. Those who don't know Camp Technologies, we are a load balancing company. F5 tries to compete with us, And I, as a product research guy, uh, try to make our product awesome. Although I'm not going to bore you with our product. The goal is to teach you about load balancing in general, how it works with Exchange and a little bit of Link as well sprinkled in there. Uh, so let's dive in. Agenda. We're going to talk about load balancing basics. I'm going to bore you to death with basics, even before we talk about Exchange and Link. Because when I learned Exchange, I was a Microsoft employee, and uh, Exchange 2010 was coming out. I was trying to uh, find what I'm going to use as a load balancer, because the guidance was coming out as, don't use NLB for obvious reasons. Use some other load balancer and uh, 
for that reason, when I was setting up my environments, I was trying to figure out as I learn in my labs, how do I actually set it up? So it mimics the production environment. What I need to know when I go to customer and talk to them how to set their environments up. And my biggest challenge was finding one that works with me. So I ended up not only understanding the concepts, but building my own load balancer, a very, very basic load balancer from a Linux distro. That's how I got into it. But the point is, it took me a lot to understand how it works in terms of networking, why certain things didn't work. Because when I set up that first load balancer of my own from Linux, finding bits and pieces from internet, the first thing I did is set everything up as it said it would. And I sent the request, and it just kept spinning. My browser just kept spinning, and I never got the response. And I was wondering what was going on. And uh, that's why I don't want you guys to feel lost. I know you guys are mostly exchange guys. You don't necessarily deal with network directly. How many of you have set up load balancer for exchange, link, for anything else on your own? OK. And how many of you went to someone else to have them configure it for you? You just said, hey, here's the requirements. Give me a working box, right? And then I'll just point my DNS to it. Everything will be happy. Um, all right, so we're going to go into the basics. So you leave with some knowledge that you may or may not have, but you will brush up on the concepts if you know. If not, you'll learn some. Uh, we'll talk about exchange, how to load balance exchange, and then we'll talk about how to load balance link. So with that, let's look at A very, very basic question. What is load balancing? Right? What is load balancing? You have an application. You have clients. You have clients connecting to your servers. And you want to make sure that you provide some kind of high availability. Right? You distribute your traffic to more than one machine so that if one machine has a hiccup, that goes away you still have your clients going to the other machine, right? The other concept, of course, is to distribute the load when you have both of them that are healthy, or more than one machine that are healthy in the pool. As the client traffic comes in, you don't want one guy to be completely buried and the other guy is taking a nap. So with the load balancing, you just distribute the load between the servers, use different logic, and provide that high availability as well as some resource balancing. So what does it look like? Like I was saying in my introduction, right? Early times meant huge machines, lots of resources, mainframes and such. One big box, you spent a lot of money. It has a lot of power, a lot of capabilities. You set up something on it, whether it's your application, whether it's your website, whatever. And um, that's it. That just works. You have redundancy built into the box itself. You have redundant processors, redundant RAM. If you guys have dealt with uh, mainframes, you know what it looks like. It doesn't look anything like the servers that look like today. right? I mean, I actually have in, in, in my uh, backpack something of that size that actually is a server. It's running Hyper-V, it's running stuff on it, multiple virtual machines. You can't imagine having that in 95 or even earlier, right? You had a mainframe that looked this tall and had all the stuff. It was very powerful, it was very expensive, but it was single point of failure. Well, it had redundancy, like I said, in the components, but from the infrastructure perspective, that was one box, right? As Intel started picking up, as um, Bill Gates started making more money, as Intel started coming out with the pizza boxes, as the servers became more commodity, it became a concept of scaling out instead of scaling up. Right? You have your application, you have your website, dot-com boom, uh, you have so many uh, connections hitting your e-commerce website all of a sudden, now that you're famous, 
right? You needed more power and you needed startup scaling out. As you do that, how do you make sure the client knows where to connect? Right? You have server1.website.com, server2.website.com, server3.website.com. How do you make it look as a single website to the client? Right? You, could, you could go to DNS, create an entry www.website.com, make it a C name, point it to all three servers, do a DNS round robin. That's one way of doing it. Right? And then there are other ways of doing it. But that's, that's where the concept comes from. Now that you started scaling out, you got to have that other option, something else that allows you to handle that scale out without making client do the work of figuring out which of these servers I'm supposed to connect to, right? To, to user, to the, uh, to the client machine, to the client application, it's a single endpoint. And then with the single endpoint, with introduction of load balancing concepts, with introduction of global load balancing concepts on top of that, now you can send traffic to the websites based on your proximity. So if a client is uh, going to Google from China, it goes to the servers that are closest to them. It doesn't take a round trip across the globe, right? And once it gets to the data center, where you have a bunch of Google servers, or Bing servers, sorry. <laughs> when it gets there, now it, it, it got to the set of servers, the load balancer then takes care of the rest and sends it to the server that's healthy or has more resources, whatever the logic you're using to distribute the traffic. So um, what did load balancing solution look like? You, have, you don't have one, you have many, right? Many different ways of load balancing, DNS round robin being one. Very simple, create multiple entries in DNS with the name and the IP address of each different server and when you make a query, client gets the response with all those IP addresses. It cycles through them depending on OS or the browser, they have different logic of how to address that. Of course, DNS server itself has a different logic. So as you query the same name to the same DNS server twice, it would give you a different order. So you're basically going and looking at that, going through all the IPs as you make different queries. You would pick one IP at one time, second the other, and so on. What's the problem with that? Sorry? Yeah, so DNS has no intelligence, right? It depends on the client logic. Client logic is basically doing a round robin. What if it hits a server that just went down? Well, now you wait for the DNS timeout, right? Doesn't check the health, doesn't know if the server is busy or not. It just does the round robin, that's what it does. Um, Windows NT introduced load balancing service, right? Windows NLB, as we know it now, is a second version of what came out from Windows NT, the load balancing service. Part of the server, you set up a bunch of servers, create the, the, the load balancing cluster, and then add more servers to it, right? It's a relatively simple solution. It knows that the server is up or not, and it distributes the traffic, right? Um, when you create that cluster, it creates a floating IP, a load balanced IP. You send the DNS entry to that IP, the clients connect to that. If the server goes down, and if you have multiple servers, one of the other servers will respond, so the clients won't know of the outage. Um, and that continued on with Windows 2000 and 2003, and even nowadays in 2012, 2012 R2, you have that as well. So you can use that. Um, like I said, it's a simple solution. does not have intelligence. It does not, for an example, see that the IIS service has stopped. So if the server's up, the traffic's going to it. Right? If your IIS crashed and your website is not running anymore, your client will get an error. 
it, the connection got all the way to the server. The server is not serving anything. So you get an error instead of getting to the second server that is running the website. Right. Cluster solutions. Um, you have, instead of using NLB, you have ability to use the clusters. How many of you set up uh, Exchange Cluster with 2003, 2007, right? How many of you set up Cluster with 2010 and 2013? Don't tell me you did. Exchange did it for you, right? Unless you took it upon yourself really because you wanted to create it. <laughs> yes, Exchange still uses Cluster bits, but you didn't have to set up the Cluster like you did with 2003 or 2007, if it was a shared storage. You had to create the cluster resources. You had to add the servers to it. You had to provide it the shared storage, and so on. Anyhow, so the cluster solution is, for the most part, active, passive. Now, don't question me on that for Exchange 2010 and 2013, because that is not clustering itself. That's Exchange's own logic sitting on top of clustering. And that's why you have DAG with active mailboxes here and active mailboxes here. But clustering at its core in its early age was you had that active passive clusters, right? You had one box that was active, one box that was passive. The active node owned the cluster resources. And when you connected to it, whether it was a file share that was clustered or whether it was exchange, clustered with the ESE showing up as, as a cluster resource. Um, it was active passive solution, but it presented itself just like NLB cluster. It had its floating IP, clients connected to that. If a node failed, it failed over to the next node and things just kept going. Network-based solutions, which is load balancers and ADCs, these are custom de well, purpose-built devices, right? Something that lives on your network as a separate device presents those virtual IPs to the clients and then connects to the back end, to the server. So it basically mediates the connections. As the connections are coming in, it's the endpoint for the client. The connection then from there goes to the server, comes back to the client. And since it is in the midstream from client going to the servers, it has that intelligence that is applied. And it says, well, is the server up? Is it busy? Is it not busy? Should I send the traffic to it or not? And things then go forward from there. DNS round robin, some pluses and minuses. Cost effective, of course. You don't need anything more than the DNS server, which almost everybody has, right? Who uh, uses host files exclusively? <laughs> we use it for troubleshooting, but not exclusively for in, in, in state of DNS. Uh, easy to configure. Downside, of course, is it lacks service awareness, lacks persistence. There is no persistence mechanism. so. And this, this more applies to uh, Exchange 2010, for an example, where you had to provide persistence for OWA, where you had to provide persistence for Active Sync or EWS. Persistence, we will talk about the concepts, of course, but in, in general, the persistence is as the connections come in and go to servers in the back end, you have two ways of handling that. Connection come in, load balancer says send it to server one. Client sends another request, connection comes in, so, uh, load balancer says send it to server two. That's the true way of providing very, very equal resource balancing because the, the, every request is balanced across different servers. However, the problem with that is, take an example of login. You went to OWA, you logged in, client access server one knows you have authenticated. This is 2010, of course, right? It knows you have authenticated. You, you are expecting that you will get your mailbox in the return. Instead, you get the login prompt again. Why? Because there was no persistence and load balancer decided to put you now on the second server, which has no idea you have already logged in because that state is not shared between the two client access servers. Right? The other client access server doesn't know you already logged in. So you had to provide persistence. DNS round robin? cannot provide that. It cannot provide any kind of persistence. Um, DNS caching gets in the way. 
uh, DNS caching occurs at multiple levels. DNS server itself can be caching. Upstream servers from the client could be caching. So if you have your ISP and when you get an IP address from ISP, which is dynamic, it also comes with the baggage. The baggage being the DNS server that ISP provides you. The problem nowadays you see, just off track a little bit, is you make a query that's completely illegal, which is you query something that doesn't exist. Your ISP server says, hey, I know what to do with this. Show you an advertisement, right? <laughs> and you can opt out of some of the ISPs. But the point is, you have the DNS servers between you and the authoritative DNS that is supposed to give you response for a given name, the service that you're trying to connect to. So the, the caching gets in the way, and that's why that disclaimer, anything you are doing with the service changes that has something to do with DNS has to be scheduled and give it 24 hours of window well, nowadays, you uh, drop your TTL on DNS to minutes, or whatever the minimum is allowed, and then let it marinate for 24 hours so all the DNS cache around the globe is replicated and whatnot. And then the next day, you make the change. Because TTL is tiny, the DNS caches will expire immediately. You make the change, and within a few minutes, it's, it's up. But you have to go through that pain because the caching gets in the way, right? So that's the point. Caching also applies to clients. For an example, IE. If you are using IE and you go to a certain name, you try this in your lab and it'll, it'll definitely work or rather fail. <laughs> you go to IE, connect to something, go to DNS and change it, flush your DNS cache, but your IE window is still open and try to refresh it, chances are it will fail to connect because it's IE's own cache of that given name. And um, the only way to get rid of it is close IE and start again or clear the cache, right? So the client cache also is important, not just the, brow uh, just the OS and the DNS server cache. And it all gets in the way. Windows NLB. Great product, free. I already have the server. I already can set up the, the NLB bits. And now I have a working um, load balancer, right? What's wrong with that? It's cost effective, included in Windows, but it cannot be combined with clustering, right? So if you are running Windows 2010, which is running the client access and mailbox roles, and you are setting up a DAG, now you just set up the cluster you can't have a cluster and NLB exist on the same box, same set of boxes. You can't use that. Um, it does not detect the service outages like we discussed before, right? NLB has no idea of service outage. It just looks at the server. If server is alive, it just sends on the traffic. Um, the only persistence you can get with it is source IP. So it looks at the client IP and then it sticks it to one server or the other if you enable the persistence. Um, problem with that could be if you have a client IP coming from behind the net, multiple clients show up as a single IP, and that won't distribute properly. And that applies to anything load balancing, not just Windows NLB, but I figured I'd point it out as it applies here. The other problem with Windows NLB, the way it is, is um, you have two ways you can configure it, unicast mode and multicast mode. And your n network admins aren't always happy when you set it up a certain way. It causes port flooding because um, it has that floating IP with a Mac that doesn't belong to your one or the second NIC, right? It's, it's, it's a, um, I wouldn't say fake, but it's, it's the floating Mac and floating IP. So switch has to figure out where that belongs to send the traffic on to, right? And it, it causes port flooding sometimes. So you have to configure it properly. If you're using multicasting, you have to also configure the switches so that they understand what's coming from the servers. Um, if you are interested in reading more about that limitations, that's documented in that article right there. 
Um, load balancers or ADCs. Um, I actually had somebody ask me uh, today what the ADC is and well, ADC is application delivery controller which is smart load balancer. Right? You, in today's age you don't really separate that because almost all load balancers doesn't matter which brand are ADCs. They're all smart. If they're commercially available, they're all smart. They're, they all have different features, but they're all able to, well, let me just start with, you know, what the load balancer is. But what it does is it adds intelligence of ability to detect the service outages, ability, ability to look at the server business based on many different ways, but simplest at the network layer, what you can see is Load balancer knows how many connections it has initiated to one server versus the other, and it says, well, based on the number of connections, this server might be more busier than the other one. Let me send connections there. Uh, it's not always true, though, because you could be sending one single query to one server, which makes it 70% busy, and the other one has 60 connections, but is just taking a nap because it's the transactional workload. It's just making a query, getting a response, and this one query, which is long running, could be taking up a lot of resources. So the point is, using many different ways, load balancers, ADCs are able to detect whether the server is busy or not, um, whether to send the traffic to that or not. It has application awareness, which is very important. It knows depending on the load balancer and depending on the workload, it knows, let's say, exchange is healthy or not. It knows OWA itself, different workloads, OWA, ActiveSync, uh, RPC, and so on, is active or not, and whether to send the traffic to that or not. So you can get granular, and you can, instead of taking the whole server out of rotation, you can take only that protocol out of rotation because let's say OI is not healthy on server one, but everything else is, I can continue sending traffic to that server for whatever is healthy, and when it comes to OI, I would say, well, that server doesn't have OI working properly, so let me not send it there, let me send it somewhere else. So that's the application awareness, application level intelligence. Scheduling options, you have a lot of different ways of scheduling. You can say, well, when the new connection comes in, do a round robin, select the next server, and then select the next server. May be optimal, may not be optimal, depending on the workload. You can say, well, use the wait, because I know when I built server one, I built it two years ago, I just got the other server that's running same config, but it's a newer server running more RAM, more processing. So give it a wait and say, you know, this server should get more connections than the other one. So, so many different ways of scheduling how you want to schedule your new connections, where you want to send them. Uh, SSL offload and bridging. Um, the offload was very popular. It, I think, is still popular in many ways. How many of you actually want offload with Exchange 2013? Nice. Not a single hand, and I like that. 2013, when it came out, did not offer offloading. 2010 had that option. You could offload SSL, which means you're telling Exchange to expect plain text traffic on port 80 instead of encrypted traffic on 443 coming from wherever it's coming from. And that wherever usually is that load balancer that's offloading SSL. So your client connects to load balancer with SSL, from that to your exchange is unencrypted traffic. And the reason I like none of you raising the hand is you're all thinking about security end to end, and that's very nice. Uh, 2013 SP1 offers offloading if you really need that for some reason. Um, the point here, though, is load balancers and ADCs are capable of both offloading and bridging. Offloading means you're terminating the connection at load balancer and you're not encrypting the traffic from there on. Bridging, on the other hand, is you're terminating the client connection on load balancer. So your load balancer has SSL certificate. And then from there to the server, you're re-encrypting the traffic again. So it's end-to-end -end encryption. Intrusion prevention, caching, compression, 
when optimization, way too many features to fit in this slide are all part of that load balancing ADC uh, category. So, real stuff. Load balancing mechanisms. Now, this would resonate with you guys. Layer 4, layer 7. How many of you have heard that layer 4, layer 7 in some context, right? 2010, your load balancer has to be layer 7 or layer 4? Exchange 2010. 7, okay. How about 2013? It can be layer 4. It doesn't have to be layer 4, but it can be layer 4, which simplifies things greatly. What is the difference between the two, four and seven? Layer four is basically, in very plain terms, well, let me go back a little bit. I love this because I started my, my journey in IT with network essentials. How many of you remember that? as an MCP, the Microsoft Certified Professional. Right, how many of you remember all seven layers? <laughs> so it starts at the cable, then it comes to the network card, then it comes to upper stack, comes to IP, then it says whether it's TCP or UDP, then it passes on to presentation layer, application layer, right, all the seven layers. Layer four is right after the routing is complete right after your IP section is done. So your traffic has been sent, it has went through the router, and it, ha it has ended up somewhere, being a load balancer. What do you do at that point as a load balancer if you are a layer four load balancer? What you do is you take the traffic, simply pass it on to the server. You do look at the health. You do look at whether the server is up or not, you look at the health, and then you just pass the traffic on. You have no idea what's inside the packet. You have all the information from the header, IP, source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and so on. You have no idea what's inside the packet, right? You don't know whether the request is going to OWA. You don't know whether the request is going to ECP. You have no idea, right? You're layer four. You're just taking the packet, pack it in, pack it out. Very simple, very quick. You have to do no processing, well, a little bit of processing. You keep a table of which client source IP or whatever re, uh, way you are figuring out what the, IP, what the client is. You look at the client and you say, this client, I send it to this server. When the response from that server comes back, I'm supposed to send that back to this client. That's all it does. Just sends the packet in, pack it up, right? Higher throughput, simple configuration. Um, the reds are the, 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 the cons, right? No application layer visibility. Um, the requirement, because it's packet in, packet out, you cannot then from load balancer go to a router and then to a server. Your server cannot be hops away from you. It has to be on the same subnet, right? It has to be on the same IP range without having to go through the router to the server from load balancer. If you do that, layer four is going to not work. It's just going to break. Um, you cannot apply advanced application logic, right? So let's say you have a website where you have some merchandise and you have the media, you're serving media, like Amazon. Amazon serves books and stuff you can buy and also streams movies, right? When the traffic comes to you, you want to apply the logic so that if the request is for the shopping cart, send it to this set of servers. If the request is for streaming a movie, send it to this set of servers because the characteristics is totally different. Well, you can only do that if you have visibility into the traffic. Remember with layer four, you can't see anything in the packet. You have no idea what the request is for. So that's the downside of it. Layer seven gives you application layer visibility, which means you have to have a way to look into the packets. For all the traffic in terms of exchange, well, almost all of the traffic is coming over HTTP, HTTPS, right? RPC over HTTP. OWA, EAC or ECP, all the other active sync and other traffic, that's all HTTPS. Comes to the load balancer, give it a, 
um, certificate that the client is expecting, trusted and whatnot. Decrypt the traffic. Once you de decrypt the traffic, now you can see what the request is for. What is the URL? Slash OWA. Oh, that request is for OWA. Let me send it to here. You know, oh, that request is for slash cart. Let me send it to this set of servers. You can gain visibility into that with layer 7. Now, what it also means, because you're exchange guys, you know, RPC is encrypted not with SSL certificate. It's encrypted at the server level, right? The Windows server RPC is encrypted there at the OS level. So, even if you put HTTP, well, SSL certificate on your load balancer, you still cannot see inside the RPC. Because RPC is using HTTP as a transport. RPC packets themselves are encrypted, unless you disable encryption completely on the server side. Right? Don't do that. Try not to do that. You're not gaining more intelligence by doing that, looking into RPC traffic. The point is, you need to understand the protocols that you're dealing with, whether just simply you know, decrypting SSL is going to give you all the information you need to be intelligent or not. Just understand that. Um, with layer 7, you gain that intelligence. You can make more informed decisions for failovers, for load distribution, whatnot. The only downside there is configuration may require deeper understanding. Deeper understanding of load balancing, deeper understanding of network topology, deeper understanding of application traffic. What is application doing? What am I supposed to be looking at? Right? Once you open that Wireshark and you see the whole lot of stuff in there, you might feel lost. I did. I had no idea what I was looking at beyond the IP source and destination and ports. Depending on the application, if you don't have understanding of the application itself, you're just looking at a bunch of packets with lots of information. Right? So, Layer 7 makes you awesome, but at the same time, it makes you spend a lot more time understanding stuff that goes around with it. OK. Um, one arm versus two arm. So let's talk about that. One arm. How many of you have set up one arm configurations? And why did you do that? A couple of arms. Good. Any particular reason why you did that? Simpler config? OK. Yeah, um, there, there are a lot of things that go around that. But let me explain what one arm is to start with. What one arm is, is your load balancer has an interface. It could have multiple interfaces on the network, right? You have one interface. You assign it an IP address. Let's call it a management IP. Now you assign it another IP address that is going to be your virtual IP that the clients are going to connect to. And then you're going to go to these different servers in the back end. With one arm, your load balancer and your server sit on the same subnet. The clients could be anywhere. Clients could be on the same subnet. They could be on a separate subnet. But your load balancer and your servers basically sit on the same subnet. Now, if I simplify that, let me see if I can do that here. Um, OK, yeah, that works. If I Oop, that's not going to work. Um, imagine a line, just a straight line, right? That's your network cable, or that's your network. You have a server hanging off of that line that's connected to the same cable. And then you have another drop coming from the same cable that's going in the load balancer. That's one arm. It's a single cable, single interface going into load balancer. So your client comes in, goes to load balancer. The packets then flow out of the same cable going to the server. I'm simplifying here a little bit. But that is one arm, right? And so let's look at what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. You have your load balancer that's 10010 at the bottom, in the middle. You have 10001 up there, which is a router. And then you have a bunch of servers, right? On the right-hand side, you have four servers. They're all, note that they're all, including the load balancer and those four servers, are all on the same subnet, right? 
Now, if I was really to screw with your heads, I would make the subnet mask slash 27 and then give it different IPs, and then I'll tell you to figure out if they're on the same subnet or not. But let's just simplify. It's class C. They're all on the same subnet. Just trust me. <laughs> so at that point, that's one arm. Your clients connect to 10.0.0.10, and then load balancer passes the traffic onto servers, gets the traffic back, goes to the client, everything is happy. Or is it? Right. What's the problem? Let me show you the problem. So here's our client. The client notice is on the same subnet as load balancer and the servers, right? It does not need to go through the router. It sends the traffic onto the load balancer. Load balancer passes the traffic onto the server. What will server see? Server will see the IP address of, you have no idea of what, because I haven't told you how the load balancer is configured. <laughs> right? Your answer, whatever you said, is right, depending on how load balancer is configured. You could configure NAT, and at this point, it's going to see IP of load balancer, and it's going to respond to the load balancer. If you didn't configure NAT, it would see the IP address of the client, and it would respond back to the client. So. It responds back to the client because it's the same subnet. It doesn't have to go through the router. We haven't set up the source net, right? What's going to happen at this point? Do you have to do anything else? Or does it just work? If you didn't configure source net, and that's why you see the traffic going straight back to the client, you're going to see an error. And you're not going to see an error either. If you are trying to go to OWA, all you see is your browser just spinning, waiting for the response? If you look at network, if you look at network trace in Wireshark, you will see the response is coming from the server. Right? The problem is, client sent the traffic to 10.0.0.10. He said, hello, Mr. X. And the response came from Mr. Y. I'm not, expect I'm, I'm not expecting a response from that guy. I'm expecting a response from the person who I asked the question. Right? So it drops those packets. The client drops the packets and says, this is not for me. I'm not going to do anything with it. What you need to do is you need to set up netting because you have to force a way for the packets to go back to the load balancer. And then load balancer will rewrite the source and destination. It will say the traffic is coming from me. Here's your answer. Client will accept the traffic. Or you could set up DSR, the direct server return, which is you have to configure each of these servers to fake that the traffic is coming from IP address of the load balancer. Right? You're setting up a DSR. I learned that the hard way when I built my first load balancer I was talking about earlier. Right? Anyhow, let's take a look at the other guy. So now the client is on a different subnet, 101051, right? It's a different subnet. The traffic's coming in to the load balancer through the router. Of course, I have simplified it a little bit here, but the traffic then goes to a server. The server could return the traffic again, depending on how the load balancer is configured, through the load balancer or through the router. So let's like, take a look at the, through the router response, because you haven't configured the NAT. Right? Since you haven't configured the NAT, the response goes from the server because it sees the IP address of the client, sends the traffic back to the client through the router. As the response comes back, the router does not modify the header, so the source stays 10.0.0.11. So that's the source. Destination is client IP. Client says, well, who are you? I'm not talking to you. Drop the packets. Right? Same thing. Not fun. So what do you do in this case? Again, something like the previous example. Set up a source net so that the IP that server sees is the IP of the load balancer. Traffic goes back to load balancer. Load balancer responds back to the client. Everyone is happy. Or configure server to use your load balancer as a default gateway. Now, because the client is not on the same 
subnet, it will use load balancer. Load balancer sees the traffic relates to existing connection, does its magic, tells the client, here's your response, client is happy, right? Or, third option, or, set up DSR, set up direct server return. Configure server to fake the IP address of the load balancer, right? And not necessarily the IP address of the management IP, remember that. It has to be the IP that the client is expecting the response from. Okay, fun? All right, two arm. What does two arm look like? Consider me a load balancer. I have one arm, that's the client side, and the other arm that's connecting to the servers, right? Consider me a router, to simplify. I have the traffic coming in from one side, clients are always on that side of the network, and servers are always on the other side of the network, right? So that's the two arm. Um, so let's take a look at that. Here's our two arm. I have two IP addresses, one on the client side, the other one on the server side. That does not stop me from putting a client on the same subnet as the servers. And why I am doing that is simple. In exchange, your client access, when you request a mailbox export, what does it do? It uses MRS. It makes a request. When you issue the commandlet, you're issuing a commandlet, your remote session is actually carried out by the server itself. So the server is making the request of exporting the mailbox. Where does that request go? To the URL of EWS, which is load balanced. So the request from client access server goes to load balancer and then comes back to wherever load balancer decides to put the traffic. It could be the same server, it could be a different server. The problem is, server is on the same subnet as the other server. And that's why I have in this example, you have that client which is on the same subnet, even if you're two arm. You make a request, the request comes in, traffic goes to the server, server responds to who? Again, depending on how the load balancer is configured, right? So it's just simple setup, you haven't done anything fancy, response directly to the client. Response comes to the client, of course the expected result is that big X, client drops the packets. Solution? Configure source net, and everyone's happy. Or configure DSR. No different from one arm, right? Now, the clients come from outside, from a different subnet. You have two arms, so you're still making requests to that 10.1 interface because that's the client side interface, right? You make that interface, request goes to the server, no source net goes to the router and then on to the client, and then you, as expected, get a big red X. Solution, source net, load balancer as a default gateway, or DSR. How is that different from previous slide? Not at all, right? Same, I mean, you saw in one arm you did the same thing. In two arm, you did the same thing. The only difference is where the clients are connecting to. So your 10051, uh, 10 the client that is on same subnet as your servers, went through the router to the client side IP because that's the published endpoint for the service, and then came back in to that subnet to the servers. But other than that, there is nothing different here. You still had to do the source net or DSR or use your load balancer as a default gateway, right? I want to, to drive that home. Transparent connectivity, and, and this is important, and you will see it will start becoming more clear, I guess, in your head as we, as we keep going forward. Transparent connectivity means when the client makes a request to the load balancer, load balancer does not change the source IP. When the server gets the request, server says, oh, I see the client IP, and it responds to the client IP, depending on how it's configured, if it's a source net or whatever, right? 
But it cannot be source net because we are trying to be transparent. You're not netting, you're not changing the source IP. You're sending the client IP as is to the server. When would you need that? SMTP, where you have enabled IP filtering, right? You have SMTP server, you want to do the IP filtering. If you're not transparent, what do you see? IP address of load balancer. What are you filtering? You're not filtering anything at that point except the load balancer IP. And if you allow the load balancer IP, well, everything else coming through that pipe is going to be allowed because you never see the client IP. You just see the load balancer IP. So that's where transparency might be needed, right? Enable transparent connection. Now, what's the problem with that? It will sound very, very familiar. You have your client coming through the load balancer, going to the server, and the response, because the server sees the client IP, is going to be direct from server to the client. However, you don't see that in the figure here. Because my client is out there on a different subnet, I have to have some way to get it back through the load balancer. If I have configured load balancer as a default gateway, server will respond through the load balancer. Not because you have a source net, it's a transparent connection, but because to go outside of its subnet, server only knows default gateway or static route, which takes it through the load balancer. And load balancer does its magic, everything works fine. Right? If that was not configured, if the source net was not configured, that's what's going to happen. Your connection is going to go through the router instead. Source net is not configured on purpose. We are trying to be transparent. We are trying to preserve the IP. But on the server, we haven't used load balancer as our default gateway. So it uses whatever its default gateway is. Response comes back to the client. Client's not expecting response from there, eh. right? What do we do here? You cannot enable source net. You cannot enable source net, so you have two options. Send the traffic back through load balancer, use load balancer as a default gateway, or configure DSR, have server fake that IP, right? Non-transparent connectivity, which is basically netting. Traffic comes in, I create a new connection to the server. Server only knows me as the source, being a load balancer. Server then responds back to me as a load balancer, and load balancer knows who the client was, does the mapping, sends the traffic back, client's happy. So, again. One more animation, but you know what it looks like now, and uh, everyone's happy, right? It's a load balancer connection. This one's no different. This is just showing you how the traffic can flow through the router. Now, why this is important, I have done that on purpose, is you would notice one of the server up there is in a different subnet, right? With transparent connectivity, I cannot do that. With layer four, I cannot do that. Layer four, I have to have the servers that are local to the load balancer. With layer seven, or with non-transparent connectivity, well, layer seven has nothing to do with it. Non-transparent connectivity, where on load balancer, you're rewriting the IP of the source. You are the source, load balancer is the source. Sending the traffic, doesn't matter whether direct to the server because it's local or through the router because server is remote. The traffic goes there, server knows who the source is, which is load balancer. Traffic comes back to the load balancer, and load balancer then does its magic, sends a response back to the client, and everything's happy. Of all these four different slides, the biggest difference is the server is remote, right? That is not possible with transparent connectivity. That is only possible with non-transparent connectivity. 
Okay. Um, so, um, how does the, the, the direct server return work? Right? How do you configure your Windows server for DSR if you wanted to go that route? It works with a very simple configuration. What you have to do is you have to, um, on the server, create a, lo a loopback adapter, give it the same IP of the load balanced IP, the IP that you have configured as a VIP on the load balancer for whatever name you're trying to load balance. Um, give it a subnet mask of that IP as all 255s. What you're trying to do is disable ARP. You don't want that server to respond to the ARP on the network, right? Set your routing interface metric to 254 on loopback so that OS does not ever use that adapter as the adapter to send the traffic out, right? It's a loopback. The traffic's not going to get anywhere, but you don't want OS to select that NIC. And then enable the weak host. The weak host is important because by default, OS is trying to be secure. If the traffic comes in from an interface that does not have that IP, the IP that you're trying to fake, the IP that's actually living on the network somewhere else, you have to tell OS it's OK. Send the traffic as the IP that doesn't belong to that NIC. Let it be, because I'm trying to do that, I know, right? So here's the first step. You add the loopback adapter. On 2012, 2012 R2, you would see KM test. On previous versions, you won't see KM test. That's the change from previous versions to the new one. Just keep that in mind. But look for loopback adapter, right? Add that, configure IP. You don't need to configure DNS. You don't need to configure default gateway. You are not going to route. You are not going to send anything over that NIC. Make sure your subnet mask is all 255s. Set the metric right there to 254. And then run those three commands, which is basically setting that weak host behavior that I talked about. There is that link that explains what that weak host or strong host behavior is, how it works. All right, so let's look at scheduling and a couple other things. So scheduling is you're telling load balancer how to send the traffic as the connections keep coming in from one side because you're not always going to have one or two connections. You're going to have thousands of connections. How do I send those thousands of connections to those few servers I have? How do I decide which server should I send my connection next, right? I have a connection came in. Let's take an example of first connection. I send it to whichever server. It's not going to matter. But then the second connection comes in. I may want to send it to the same server. I may want to send it to a different server. How do I decide that? That's what scheduling is. You say round robin is just going to send it to one, then the next, then the next, then the next, comes back to the first one, and then goes in the circle. You do the least connection. It says, well, this one has five connections. This one has six connections. I'm going to send the next connection to the one that has least amount of connections. right? And then it goes in that circle. Response time. Which server is fastest? When your uh, probe from load balancer goes to the server, it says, well, I'm getting that guy milliseconds earlier than the other guy. Well, that guy might be better. I'm just going to send my request there. We talked about wait round robin. You give it a wait because one server has newer hardware than the other one. That might be a better candidate for most connections. Give it a wait. One has a wait of 100. The other one has a wait of 98 because it's a little bit of delta between the hardware. You have another server that's very, very old. Give it a weight of 50. Now it will distribute 100 connection to one server when it does 98 to the other. And again, it's not literally that 198. It's a simplification of the idea, right? Persistence. Persist a connection from same client to the same server. We talked about OWA. We talked about the cart, shopping cart and such. Right, so that's persistence. Many ways of doing that. Source IP, you look at the IP where it's coming from and send it on. 
anything coming from the same IP always goes to the same backend, and so on. HTTP headers, server or load balancer generated cookie, which in 2010, you're probably very familiar with these concepts, right? In 2010, we looked at the um, Canary, you looked at the OWA Outlook session cookie, uh, you probably issued your own cookie and so on. Many ways of doing that, but that's what persistence is. SSL offload and bridging, now in interest of time, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. But the SSL offload, you know what that is. Offload is I terminate the connection to the load balancer. Load balancer onto the server is not encrypted, and that's offload. Bridging is where I re-encrypt the session, right? That certificate cliff <laughs> basically is uh, a mandate that came out from the certificate CA board the Certificate Issuing Authorities Board, that says we are not going to issue the certificates from X date that will have internal names. So if your domain is lab.local, right, or contoso.local, something like that, that does not match your public name, contoso.com, if CA sees that name, he's gonna say, well, I cannot issue a certificate that has that name in it, right? If you put an IP address in the certificate request, it's gonna say, well, it's uh, 192168 or 10. It's not a routable IP. I'm not gonna issue a certificate for that, right? That 2015 date is important. When that happens, you're not gonna get those new certificates. And the certificates you're requesting today that has that private name in it, those are going to expire on that date you would notice they would not issue the certificates that are going farther than that date with the private names in it. Which means Exchange, Exchange uses private names often, right? Um, other workloads, of course, use those names. What is the best way of addressing that when you're talking load balancing? You could easily have the public certificate that has public names with the clients coming from outside connecting to you, whether you're bridging or offloading, and we're talking bridging because that's why this is important, is Load Balancer has that public cert with public names in it. Your server has cert with the private names in it. And you could have same or another Load Balancer that takes connections from clients from inside that are going to talk to the servers using that internal name, put the certificate on the load balancer. Now you have two separate WIPs. You have two separate certificates. Internal clients see the certificates that they're expecting with the internal name. External clients see the certificates they're expecting with the external name, and everyone is happy, right? And you're bridging, so your server could be any certificate, including the internally issued certificate. And since, since it is internal CA, you could issue whatever you want. It could be IP address internally, it could be internal name, and it's all fair because it's your internal CA. All right, so moving on. Load balancing exchange 2013. Now this one is gonna be one minute and we're done. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, however, it's very simplified. It's very simplified, right? What you have is 2013 made updates in client access server, so the client access server is now a protocol proxy, right? Your connections come into load balancer. How many of you read those series of posts from Russ Smith talking about load balancing, talking about namespace planning, certificate planning, right? Talks at length about the changes in, uh, in uh, client access server and so on. Anyhow. It's very simple, so what happens is connection comes in, client access says, well, I'm gonna put it on the server, the mailbox server, that has the mailbox active. So, whichever your mailbox server is that's hosting your mailbox is where the connection is always going to go. The difference between 2010 and 2013 is it's not going to care or render on client access. It's only going to proxy the connection. So now what you can do is you can have a load balancer at layer four, connect to your client access servers. It doesn't matter which one of those client access servers you send the traffic to, 
Client access server will proxy to the server that actually hosts your mailbox, has the session, so you log on to OVA, it renders your page, mailbox server is doing that work. You go through client access one, you get the same view that you went through the client access two, you got the same data because it's the same session on the mailbox server, not the client access server. So they don't need to know what's going on. They're just sending the connection on, right? What's important is because your layer four load balancer, you're not looking at, or you don't even need to have SSL certificate on the load balancer, you're sending the traffic on, the, the certificate that you have on the client access server matters now. You have all the client access servers, they all need to have the same certificate assigned to each one of them. If you don't do that, client access server one gets the request, it authenticates the user, sends the response back with the cookie, um, that has the information of authentication, it's encrypted. Request goes back, your load balancer then sprays the connection to the second server. Second server tries to decrypt that cookie, but the SSL certificate is different. It cannot decrypt that cookie. It cannot see whether you're authenticated or not. What's the expected experience here? You get the authentication prompt again, right? You can get into a loop. You can literally get into a loop. You just set up a simple load balancing with no certificates assigned and it just goes in a loop. You just keep getting authentication prompts. Make sure your certificates are correct. Same certificate assigned to all the, all the CAS servers, which also means it's not gonna be self-signed. You have to get the real certificate. Okay, with service spec one, SSL offloading is possible. MAPI over HTTP is a new transport mechanism, so if you're using layer seven load balancing, account for that if you're starting to filter the, the host name or the virtual directories. Okay. Windows NLB, I would make it simple, don't use it. I know I'm rushing a little bit, but we don't have too much time, I'm sorry. Um, there are, and I gave you the URL earlier if you want to see what the issues are, but just no, don't use it. DNS round robin, again, we talked about the pros and cons. Don't use it. There, there are people who argue DNS round robin should just work fine with 2013 because CAS is protocol proxy and uh, mailbox is doing the work. But no, it does not detect the gray errors. It doesn't see that the protocols are down when the server is up. And the counter argument could be that the managed availability will address that, but managed availability itself is a component that could fail. Right, so don't use DNS round robin. Um, namespace planning, unbounded and bounded models, regional models, these are the ways you can assign different namespaces. You have a single namespace that is inside and outside using the same name to connect to the servers, right? Split DNS, so outside sends you to the outside load balancer IP, inside sends you to the IP on the inside. Regional namespaces, you have multiple data centers, you're sending europe.contoso.com, na.contoso.com, right? The regional namespaces. Um, managed availability monitors each exchange component. So it basically, in terms of load balancing, it's very helpful because load balancer doesn't have to be very, very intelligent. It doesn't have to know how exchange works. It just has to query managed availability over that URL that's published. For each protocol, you have a healthcheck.htm. So pick a protocol, like in this example, OI and EWS, you have a protocol, just add slash healthcheck.htm to it, and you would see the response come back 200 okay if the protocol is healthy, right? It's a lot of work going on in the back end with the managed availability, but for us, it's simple. Just send the traffic there. If you get the response, server is healthy, market is healthy, send the traffic there. Right? Okay. Load balancing scenarios. Keep it simple. Layer four, single namespace, traffic comes in. You look at, because you're not layer seven, you have only one of many possible scenarios that you can look at. So let's look at OWA for health check. Right? You look at OWA for health check, OWA comes back healthy, you send the traffic to that guy. 
You're not doing any SSL magic. You're not doing any of that. It's a traffic in, traffic out. Remember all the limitations of layer four and transparent connections, right? So as you do that, the traffic goes there, comes back, um, and what if you're testing OWA and OWA goes down, but everything else is up? Load balancer has no idea because you can only have one health check, right? With layer four, you're checking one thing and you're saying, well, OWA is up because you have no intelligence into the requests coming in. You say, OWA is up, I'm sending traffic there. OWA is not up, I'm not sending traffic there. The downside of that is you're taking the whole server offline for one protocol instead of being granular. Also, pre-authentication and other magic is not possible. So let's look at this one. Layer four, single namespace, traffic comes in, hits the load balancer. You check the health of the server over one protocol, send the traffic on, and then you get the response. Um, in this one, you have single namespace. Uh, well, so this one's adding the health check, showing you the health check. You have OWA, right? OWA is healthy, the traffic goes on for all the protocols because it's layer four. In this case, we also have auto discover as a separate namespace. And because of that, you can have a separate health check for auto discover itself, right? If you were using SRV record for auto discover, chances are you pointed to mail.contoso.com. Now you're tied to that single health check also for auto discover. And that's why you have that. Um, now, let's take an example of OWA not being healthy. All the other protocols are healthy, right? But they are marked as down because the entire server is taken out of rotation. And there you go. Nothing flows to those, those, those protocols, right? Auto discover being on its own flows. <laughs> All right, layer seven. Um, I'm still on layer four, okay, never mind. Uh, layer four with multiple namespaces, how you address that problem is, if you want to stay true layer four, is have multiple namespaces, which means you have multiple IP addresses, each name going to its own IP address on the load balancer, and then you're checking everything individually. You're checking each one, OWA is down. The other traffic keeps flowing to the load balancer and onto the servers. Right? Because we have individual namespaces for each protocol. Not necessarily the best way to get there. But if you want to really stay layer four because it saves you money, it gives you performance, load balancer doesn't have to be very complicated setup, that's another option. Okay. Um, layer seven with single namespace. Here, you're assigning an SSL certificate. Now you have ability to go to each protocol, because you're layer seven, you can segregate the traffic. You know what the traffic is coming in for, right? And then you, sorry. So you segregate the traffic and you can forward the traffic appropriately. So single namespace, health check issued, always down. I'm not gonna send the traffic to that server, but for everything else, I'm gonna continue using that server because it's healthy. Now you're getting granular, you're getting more out of your servers while addressing the failures. Make sense? All right. Uh, SSL offloading, which is new in service spec one, you could do that. There are some things you have to do. There is the URL, read that. It's a lot to cover in a slide, but you have to uh, run a few things to tell server to expect unencrypted traffic, and then you can offload at the load balancer. The only thing to um, be aware of is MRS proxy, most commonly in the hybrid scenarios when you're moving the mailboxes from on-prem to hybrid or backwards, it uses MRS proxy. In any case where MRS proxy is in use, especially in hybrid, it's expecting encrypted traffic to it. So you cannot offload that, which means EWS cannot be offloaded in those scenarios. Okay. All right. Guest server uses self-signed certificate out of the box. How many of you actually change that to something else? It's a good idea to do that. If you're not doing that, do that. Use internal ZA. 
<laughs> use external CA. Use a trusted certificate so client doesn't get errors, right? Out of the box, you don't want to use that. Uh, we talked about the cookies that are issued by CAS that is encrypted, which means you want to share the same certificate across all client access servers that are sitting behind the same service on the load balancer. All right. And now the demo. We have two minutes left. Let's see what we can do with that. So here, um, some of the things I have already taken care of. So the good thing is, let's assume the exchange is fine, right? We are on the load balancer. And what we are going to do is, this one is internal load balancer. We are going to, first things first, oh, actually, you know, you're not seeing it. I'm the only one seeing it. <laughs> Right, here's the load balancer. What we're gonna do is, the first thing I'm gonna do is, bear with me a second. Okay, so I'm going to create a virtual service on the load balancer. What I'm going to do is add a new service. So let's go here, add a new service. I have an IP address dedicated for Exchange. So that's, and I already have the DNS entry that's pointing to that IP. So right now, all the clients are broken because there is no load balancing done, right? I want it to be port 443. I want it to be Exchange 2013 um, and add the service. Now, what do you do here? On the options, you do not configure it to be anything fancy. However, notice that I have layer seven configured and I'm going to take off transparency. Don't let that scare you. It's in terms of Microsoft layer four, you're not offloading the SSL, you're passing the traffic through. In terms of load balancing for the one I'm using, layer seven means I have to create two TCP sessions. That way I can achieve non-transparent connection, server always responds to me, and then I respond to the client. That is very, very important for us being Exchange. If you're transparent, Exchange will try to respond directly to the client, and if you want to do that, you will have to do the DSR. So take off the transparency, let it be round robin. I don't need to do anything fancy here, right? Round robin between the client access servers, no problems at all. We are not doing anything with SSL, so uh, we just skip over the SSL and all the other advanced stuff. We go to the server and we configure the health check. That's the important one. So, okay, health check HTM. So it's going to check over health check. And then we add the servers. Pretty simple. Uh, let me see. The IP address for those servers are, all right, here we go. So that's one IP, and that is another. I've got two servers in there, right? I have the health check. I'm not doing anything fancy beyond that. And we just got to make sure that the health check comes back healthy. Right now it's down, but I just added the servers. so. When the health check goes through, it didn't because I didn't configure the health check properly. So let's do that. I'm going to do a get. And when I do that, I'm going to get a response with 200 OK. The load balancer is going to see that the response is coming back. My servers are now marked healthy. I should be able to go to it, and I should be able to connect. So right here, we go to mail.contoso.com, you add slash OWA, you make sure it's HTTPS, and you would get to OWA. Now, of course, it's giving an error. What did I say do you do first on CAS? Change the self signed cert to something more useful, right? So, okay, I ignored it, and what happens? You remember that loop? 
Instead of seeing that loop at the logon prompt, you're seeing the loop at the SSL prompt. Because it's going to the other server, which is again giving you self-censored, which is not trusted. You keep clicking and you keep going. Not something you want to do. It's not configured right. You have to go to client access servers, configure it right, and then everything will be fine. Let's do that real quick. So in here, I am on Exchange 1, so I should be able to just go ECP and log on as administrator. Um, go to the servers. And let's look at the certificates. What I have is three certificates. I don't have the issued one. I have all the self-signed certs, right? So in interest of time, let's just say you assign a new certificate here, not only to this server, but all the client access servers that are behind the load balancer. Assign the certificate, assign it to IAS. You see that assigned to services, which says SMTP. Make sure that new certificate you get from a trusted source, whether internal CA or external CA. Get that certificate, assign it to at least IAS, if not more. Reset the IAS so it uses the new service, a new, new SSL cert. And then, as the clients come into the server, because load balancer is not doing anything with SSL, you would see the server giving the new cert, which is trusted. Client will not give you an error. Assign, <clears throat> assign the same certificate to all the servers, and as it round robins between them, it would not get an error of authentication loop or the certificate error that we are seeing. Clear? Good? OK. All right. Um, so with that, I really want to end here. Um, I want to remind you of um, evaluation. That's very, very important for me and for us as MEC. We want to know how we did. I want to know how I did. So thumbs up, thumbs down. Either way, let me know. Don't be shy. <laughs> let me know how we did. And with that, I'll let you go. If you have any questions, I'm here. You can ask me questions. Thank you very much.